So this is a, a case study in logic models and she um, she used Birdie, her dog, as the case model. So basically you saw the dog is unhealthy and she needs to lose some weight to be healthier. And her goal, the large goal is for her to get to a healthy weight and she needs a plan or program to get there. And she needs a way to measure progress toward that goal of getting to a healthy weight. Um, and a way to determine what is working and what isn't. And so this is a program design, evaluation, and use of a logic model in everyday life. So basically the logic model works like this. It, this it, it documents what our activities are, what the agencies, programs, whatever projects do. Um, and she lists some there. Um, and then it says what we did so this person read a couple of books, she walked the dog. So the, the, the outputs are about what actions we took um, and how output measurements is how we measure the actions that we took. In this case, you know, on the education piece, yeah, the, the, the output was the reading of the books and the measurement was that they wrote something about what they read whether it be a report or whatever, um, they kept daily logs of what they of what they fed the dog and exercise they fed the dog. So these are all output measurements and the, out, the the activities that we do. But outcomes is what changes because of the activity that we have done, right? So in this case, since they read a book, the outcome is somehow I have learned more about how to keep my pet healthy and keep them at a healthy weight. And because my activity was to feed them right and to exercise them, then the outcome should be that my, my pet will be at an ideal weight. Um, then they talk about, time. we don't usually do timelines in hours because we do one year contracts. So the idea is what happens in a year. Um, but you know they can talk about how long it'll take for it to happen. Some programs are longer than others. And then um, how do we measure uh, the outcome? Um, so for example, you, it, the first one, it's hard to measure how much you've learned unless there is, unless the program you were doing did pre and post uh, um, exams to see how much you learned about pet health and weight. But the second one is pretty easy to, to measure because you can, can weigh the dog. You can see the dog. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time uh, but these on the activities piece, but here are some measurements of, so if you have an activity, how many people, the old saying butts in seats, right? Um, that, that's an output. How many people attend a session? How many people uh, take the walk? How many people do the actual activity? That's the output. A lot of our agencies, this is where they struggle. For them, butts and seats is an outcome, right? And that's not, that. that's just getting people to your program. Uh, the outcome is what happens because of the program. Um, are they more self-sufficient? Are they healthier? Are they, you know, do they, did they resolve their legal issue, et cetera? Do they feel safer? And that's, that's really what, we want to get to and that's the outcome so these are these are good outcomes 75 percent of those who attend the session will and show increased knowledge right and you and or will have attained 75 percent will attain their ideal weight those are the the, the outcome we're, we're seeing what has changed because of the activities outputs measure what the activities are they measure how they work but outcomes measure what happened what change happened um, and again, the timeline, it just depends on the program. Um, some take longer than others, um, but we contract for a year. So we wanna try and find out what their outcomes are within that year. Um, and we measure them. So they're here, they're using uh, a I love my pet assessment tool. And hopefully most agencies will have created or used. I mean, this is where the best practices piece comes in a lot of these best practices should have some type of assessment tool or agencies should be able to create some. 
Uh, and of course, in the dog's case is you weigh the dog and there's a dog in a much healthier state and their ideal weight. So any questions about, I hope this makes sense, but any questions about outcomes or I'm gonna stop sharing, um, but um, how we use outcomes or how what we're looking for in outcomes. Yeah, Brian. I really like that presentation, the, the logical way it just kind of goes through it. I think it really helps differentiate the outputs and outcomes. So I don't have any questions. I do have a protest that there are two different dogs. Birdie has a black nose. The dog at the end has a pink nose. But, you know, um, we will have accurate outcomes on ours. Your attention to detail, Brian, is one of the reasons why you're a great board member. Are there other questions for Eliberto? Um, I have a question, Eliberto, is um, I, I, I think this presentation is actually really well done, like Brian said, and is a, it's easy to follow regardless of like how much knowledge you have about this type of thing. Um, is this something that can or could be made available um, to our agency partners? like? or something along these lines? Um. So it is on, so for those agencies, when they apply, it is on the resource page. It's been on the resource page since we did it. And, right. right. Um, yeah, it is made available to them. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Seeing no other questions or comments. We will move on to the next item. Um, reviewing and commenting on the human service agency funding application um, to provide input to the funders collaborative. So Eliberto, I had a question um, and Caitlin. So did we wanna discuss anything about the, um, about the outcomes? I thought we were gonna talk about the outcomes. Oh. Karen. Okay. We were or we're not? I thought we were. This yeah, is so did you want to pull it. up that? Because we did include that in their in the packet. In, in yeah. their packet. So so continue on, Eliberto. Yeah, tonight's the Eliberto show. Sorry. It is the Eliberto yeah. show. So, I'm the backup band. So that's right. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm gonna what and, and you've all seen this before. This is not nothing new, but I'm gonna pull up um the um uh the outcomes that came out of the work that Brian and I did. Uh, in what I added to it this time was, was the was the actual outcomes that are currently and they're called goal areas that are in the application for our for our agencies to select. Um, it's a drop down list for them. They don't they see it in the in the instructions, but then when they get to the application, it's a drop down. And I can show you all when we go through the application where it is. Um, but right now, the 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 background or the, or the context for this is the city of Boulder is also doing this work too. Um, I think their, their committee is meeting tomorrow um, to talk about, because the city of Boulder is kind of doing their new human services master plan. And so they're, they're kind of doing the same thing. So Karen and I thought this is the perfect time for this board to provide input. Um, and so they're gonna put, provide input and then the collaborative will, you know, we will decide what, what are the goals that we wanna move forward in our collaborative application? So we thought this was a, I thought this was the perfect time to just get input. They may, you, you might be fine with them and, and that's okay. Or you might have other ideas and, and this is the time that we, we wanna capture those ideas and then share it with our partners. And so I'm gonna start backwards. I'm gonna have it up, but I'm gonna start, um, I'm gonna, there's gonna be a lot of scrolling really quickly here. So I apologize for that, but I'm gonna start with what is on the application right now. So I apologize for the screening for the, okay. So can everybody see these? All right. So these are the current goals on the right um, that, um, and they didn't copy over really great. Sorry, I can see at the top one is in a different blue, but those right ones are, are the actual goals. And you've seen them in our goals because, you know, when Brian and I did this, I shared these with Brian and, 
you know, we just we 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 copied some of them, but we have some other goals too. Um, and there may be some new goals that we want to add. Uh, and this and on the left is how they fit with our um, priority areas, right? Um, you'll see all our priority areas there, and you see that some some have more than others. Um, but that that those are the goals, and these are our priority areas. Okay. So I'm gonna start scrolling up, and then we're gonna we're gonna see. So I think. The and Ellie Ferto, real quick, these are the goals that are in the current funding that the collaborative as a whole um, allows folks to choose. So this is essentially the goals that are agreed upon by everybody in the funding collaborative. Correct. And, us, and the city of Boulder, and... Boulder County. Okay, thank you. Boulder County Community Services. So, so to, to, just to, again, just to set context, our collaborative right now is made up of Longmont Community Services, City of Boulder Housing and Human Services, and Boulder Community Services, Boulder County Community Services. Boulder County Housing and Human Services has a separate funding process uh, outside the collaborative. Uh, mm -hmm. They do it differently because they have different pots of money. They have federal dollars they got to deal with. So they have they do it differently than we do. Uh, but the, these are the 16 goals, there should be 16 of them, that an agency can select from when they are selecting their programs or when they're, when they're in the program section of the application. So I think the first one is safety and our, our safety net, uh, no, self-sufficiency came up first for me. Okay, so the, some of these, of course, are in, but for example, we have now bridged, the, and we could rewrite this, Brian, bridge the digital divide, or we could say increase access to um, increase digital access or increase access to devices or internet or something. Um, but just want to get folks' input. So don't worry about the blue or the green. It's really about the orange right now. Um, and to see if these are, these are the outcomes that we want to propose to the collaborative. So Eliberto, is the outcome synonymous with the goal? Yeah. Okay, thank you. In the, in, 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 so Graham, in the application is called goal area, um, but basically, yeah. It, it, yeah, I don't know why they called it that, but that's what they called it, goal area. Kimberly? How much in the weeds is, are we allowed to go into with the orange? I had a clarifying question, but I don't know if it's over analyzing. Well, you can ask question. it. <laughs> okay, the question is, it's uh, under program outcomes, at the bottom of that first box, it says increase ability to earn livable wage. I guess my question would be, do we want to increase access to positions that offer livable wages or do we wanna increase educational opportunities so people can be applying to positions that offer higher wages? So I don't know if that's too detailed, but there's a real difference there in my mind. There is. Well, I, I don't think we can increase access to positions. That's not out of our control, right? That's, we, we, we don't have the kind of control to say you need, you, we, we want you to create positions a and we don't we don't give that amount of funding we don't have that level of funding to do that so be educational opportunities that increase your ability to earn a livable wage yeah, it could okay. be that. yeah i think we could we could change it to that and i know karen's taking notes which is great so yeah that that we can we can change i think that i I like that question, Kimberly, because the other thing I'm thinking though is that some of our agencies, in addition to providing um, education to employees, also actually provide information to employers to help them. Because did we had one applicant, or we had one, yeah, one applicant last year that was talking about ways that they worked with. Um, like smuckers, I think it was, they told us, where they were basically helping identify um, specific skills that like 
Smuckers was looking for to then help match people to like they were helping them with like language and having people that could do interviews in Spanish or provide information to the Latinx community in Longmont about those jobs. So um, that seems to me like we're not funding them providing those positions, but things that help con that help employers do that better, um, I would say is, would be fair game for this and I think would be helpful. Um. It seems to me that those are exactly the right questions only because the semantics matter, right? The, these outcomes should be a, a really effective filter for us to say, for instance, does this program, does, does Spanish translation increase the ability of, of a Longmont resident to earn greater income um, or whatever the language is? And uh, my recollection is that these, these boxes are filled in from the needs assessments. And, you know, so it was kind of parsing the language primarily in those needs assessments. And then part of the idea was understanding like, is this really what, like what does this actually mean to the community on the ground? Like how do they translate something like this? How, how do they think about something like this? But um, I, I think probably some of these can be simplified, but in terms of representing what was found in the needs assessment, they seem to me to be accurate. I guess the question is, is there, um, you know, is the needs, are there changes where the needs assessment maybe, you know, some things need to be modified a little bit, or is there just so much language that it's confusing because we're, we're parsing different ideas and regrouping? Maybe on this one, I think it is like kind of parsing that, but I think looking at the beginning part of that, um, that first outcome, one thing I'm seeing is increased earnings, employment, or um, eligible benefit, like increasing the number of livable wage jobs in the community fits within that. But maybe it's a, um, that outcome is really improving overall, like number of community members that have, like that have access to livable wage jobs, um, like, or, you know, benefits and steady employment. like any one of those things kind of fit in there. Um, Cause that, that addresses both like the supply of those jobs as well as like the employee side of it. So in, in that context, Caitlin, oh, I'm sorry, Karen, go ahead. No, go ahead, Brian. Uh, I'll be quick in that, that context. It's almost like there's a header and then there's the tagline or the subtext. Um, and because I look at, like when I look at the one below, there's a general idea. And then a lot of the text really kind of paints a picture of what that idea looks like in practice or in more, more detail. Um, so, yeah. Karen. So I just wanted to clarify. Um, Caitlin, what you were saying, because I think uh, in, in terms of, you know, having access to jobs that pay a livable wage, I think I think Eliberto addressed that. So so our our focus isn't necessarily on um, making sure that on the 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 supplies type, but, you know, the supply end of supply end of things that that there are. Um, there are livable wage jobs for people to be able to access. That is in the whole economic development um, arena. That's really not um, we that that's really not our 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 role. So so I just need to clarify because it, it sounded like that that you were suggesting that that would be part of th this outcome, and I really don't think that it is. I think that's actually really useful to to recognize to say that that even if we have an applicant that comes in and that's 
what they're doing, that that's not the role of this funding, that this funding is really about it, that self-sufficiency and resilience and so it's sort of helping the employees. It's really helping people to prepare and to be successful and have the training and education kind of what, um, you know, Kim, Kimberly talked about. Yeah, I think having, uh, I, I think that's a really good question, Kimberly, and I think obviously it creates a lot of discussion here, but like understanding that like that's not what this funding is for. Like we talked about last time, there, we, there's a whole lot of other funding areas that contribute to some of our overall goals. Um, so. So, we, so Karen and I can update with the, the outcome based on what we just had the discussion, but I want to make sure that we continue yep. moving on um, to the next, um, the next uh, pillar. Arrows don't work. I hate when my arrows don't work. All right. All right. So here, here's health and well being. Kimberly. Sorry to be the one to speak again. <laughs> That's great. That's fine. Um, it's just. Uh, I guess wording here, prevent, maintain, and improve. They don't seem to be the same kind of direction towards physical health and behavioral health. So I would love to see prevent poor health, health outcomes and okay. then maintain and improve physical health and or behavioral health. Just because I think it's confusing that the word prevent doesn't really state what it's preventing and it works against the other two verbs. Okay. So to prevent poor health outcomes and maintain and improve physical and or behavioral health. That sounds great. Okay. Does it, does it make sense on this one to actually split it into two different ones? Because there's physical and or behavioral health, but then there's increased mental, increased crisis mental, like there's mental and physical health here. Um, yeah, we, and I wonder if we should just like have those be two separate things in this. Um, like all the things that go under mental and behavioral health and all the things that go under physical um, health. Yeah, and I think maybe access deserves its own too. So one thing is, so, and I, I see your hand, Brian, but so let me just finish this thought. And then, so one thing is to maintain and improve physical health. So th these are folks that are engaged in, with a program um, already but then there's also the increased access piece, which would be a separate, a different outcome. And because that's more around how do we increase engagement? And that's how you would measure that is um, increased services or increased engagement in those services. So those could potentially be, be se separated as well. Brian. Thank you. I, I agree with that and I think you know, one of the challenges here is it gets very loopy. And I mean that like in a looping sense, right? Because improving access is a means of improving physical and or behavioral health. Um, so um, is it, you know, some of it's just semantics. I mean, I think at some point, there's probably some of these where we just say, well, pick that one because it's six of one and a half a dozen of the other, but. Um, I think that's a good point. We could, yeah. Uh, to me, access almost reads like an output and not an yeah. outcome. And okay. so we maybe want to focus in on what are the, why do we care about access? Because it improves, you know, physical and mental health prevents, you know, we've got increased um, crisis mental health services. Therefore, we see a reduction in X, Y, Z, you know, we have suicide prevention or we have, um, you know, reduction in HIV transmissions in, in the county or those types of things. Um, so phrasing our outcome as an outcome and not an output might also help our, our agencies. Graham. 
Uh, yes, thanks. I have, uh, I guess, two concerns about separating it off into two. If, if we do separate it, then I think we have to uh, assign different weights and different programs might fall into different categories and thereby, you know, achieve a, a potential funding cap or percentage based on those weights, right? Or am I misunderstanding that? I guess that's one issue. And then well, the second so one, go ahead, Alberto, sorry. So let, so let me ask that. So I think, so the weights, and we, and this is part of the work that we continue and we need to do, we have, you know, that, but the weights in my mind, Grant, really come at the activities, not necessarily the outcomes. Uh, or at least that's the way that we did it last year is it was around the waiting piece came around activities. The outcomes are more of the filter, right? In other words, if they, if their outcomes fit, their programs had to fit the outcomes or had to be aligned with the outcomes to, to, to get scored. But the weighted piece was in the activity level. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Thank you. And then I guess my other concern is it's all, it's not always clear to me where the line is between the physical and the mental. I'm thinking of like substance abuse or, or mental health problems. It's, I don't know. And this is not just like an anti dualist you know, Boulder County sentiment. It's like, I don't know. It's all so intertwined. It's hard to, to separate. So. Um, Kimberly, I think I saw your hand. Yeah, it's a shy hand tonight. <laughs> um, I think identifying the fact that there are providers specific to mental health and providers specific to physical health is important. So I definitely agree, Graham, that there is that you can't have, you know, behavioral health without some level of physical health, but the, the providers giving those services are often very separate. So I think that's important to note, um, depending on who's applying for the funds. Okay, Karen, do you think we got what we need to? You're on mute, Karen. Okay. okay. Um, Eliberto, I had one quick question mm -hmm. for the outcomes. When they fill out the application, I'm just mystery. I just am not remembering when I was looking over the applications. Do they pick one outcome or can they pick multiple outcomes? Well, they can pick one outcome per program. So if they're applying for multiple programs, they can pick multiple outcomes. Got but it. Yeah, but it's, it's one outcome for program. And, and that's hard sometimes for some agencies because some agencies do multiple things. Yeah. Um, yeah, my thought there was just like whether the, the separation because providers do tend to do, tend to do one or the other, but keeping them together allows a little more flexibility for, the, for areas where maybe it fits under mental health, maybe it fits under physical health. So no, I don't have any strong opinions about that, but just was wondering if that was, that filter is basically you pick one of those and then you've got to, okay. Yep. Great, thanks. All right, moving on to the next one. I'm moving on if we don't hear anything. Uh, anyone have comments? You can wait questions? forever, Alberto, but. <laughs> I, I move it. Healthy okay. food. Uh, Brian. Thank you. This one's fortunately, uh, compared to the others, relatively straightforward. Um, I think the, you know, there's some question about the details underneath. Again, those are more kind of like descriptive, uh, adding a little more color to it. Um, so it seems somewhat straightforward. Okay. That's so I, some of these outcomes read to me like outputs again. And I wonder if the outcomes would be more like you know, cause I think we've had folks say we have 
fewer people, um, you know, fewer kids coming to school hungry, fewer um, families reporting, um, you know, not having sufficient nutrition. Um, we have an increase in families saying that they are not having, you know, food or nutrition related health issues. So I wonder if we could pull out some of the specific in outcomes because providing a larger volume of health food, higher quality food, high quality prepared food, those are like, that's what we're giving, but what, why do we care about that? Mm -hmm. We don't want kids, we don't want families to go hungry. We don't want anyone to sort of be in, you know, have food insufficiency um, because we know that that has impacts on mental and physical health, as well as, you know, overall, um, you know, ability to work and um, educational outcomes. Caitlin, thank you for that. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. So I'm, I'm wondering if it's something like increase uh, percentage of total days family has adequate access to healthy and nutritious food or something like that. Uh, no, not, a, I'm, I'm trying to get away from the access, but um, yeah. basically they have enough food, healthy food on the table to meet their needs. Yeah. You know, so, whatever that looks like. Um, so, so I think that's, that's good. And here's, here's the challenge with that because the, this, this area so for example, you're saying, you know, how many kids came to school hungry first? That's a great outcome, reducing the number of kids. But unless the school district's applying, who would measure that? Who, who's gonna so the challenge with that is who's gonna measure that outcome? Well, we had several, we had several applicants last year indicate that they did before and after surveys. And one of the questions we saw was, you know, you know, how how many days this month? did you go, did you have insufficient amounts of food for your family? I think was like one of the questions. Um, and they did like pre and post. So, um, but I don't know if all the programs can or could do that. Right. And maybe, for this, one, that one. I think maybe it's great. for this one, the output is okay because we know that this output is like in and of itself, we know it has effects that sometimes we just can't even measure because we know that it impacts so many things when when people go hungry. Kimberly. I wonder if any of our county partners like WIC or SNAP would have information around food insecurity of the clients that they're serving, um, which would definitely be a more measurable outcome. I also um, think rates of obesity among the population would be another measurable that would directly you know, address some of the outcomes listed here, here in terms of healthy food. Um, I don't know if that would be appropriate for this. I think the challenge is you, you can provide all the healthy food, but you can't control how, what people eat. And so the, the, those larger community ones are great and they're hard to measure. That's been my experience is that the, the, you know, um, they're probably the best outcomes that we could have, but they're hard to measure when they're that, when they, they're so all encompassing of the whole community. Karen. So I think just, uh, so Eliberto, I just wanted to clarify. So we are gathering this input, mm -hmm. um, which is great from our advisory board members. And then and then you're going to have a you're going to discuss this even further with oh, yeah. the city of Boulder and Boulder County representatives. So um, so just a reminder. So this is great input and we're, we're not done talking about this. So we we um, so, you know, we don't have to come to resolution, but it's really about um, these are great ideas. We're capturing those and then there'll be further discussion, which we will come back. Right. And negotiation. <laughs> Ultimately, we, we, we can. We're, this is really wonderful stuff. Yeah. And there has to be agreement from the other partners because I don't know what Boulder's going to bring to the table come Friday, right? Come Monday, Wednesday, because they're meeting tomorrow night to talk about this. So, but this is wonderful. And, and to Kimberly's point, I think, I think those larger ones are great. And maybe to Caitlin's point, 
maybe we add them as potential outcomes, but we keep this one, we keep this one available, but we think about adding those those outcomes that you mentioned too, Caitlin. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be interested in what the others have here, like to think about like, what are the outcomes that we're, that we're wanting folks to measure other than just like, oh, we gave a bunch of food away. Um, right. Like, cool, if you gave it to a bunch of people that already have access to healthy food, is that helping the community? Um, what are you measure? How are you measuring that this is going where where it needs to be and creating the outcomes from it? So, um, but that's yeah. Okay. Okay. That's great. That's great. Oh, this is huge. This is the biggie. This is it's always has been always has been the biggie. Um, yeah, and or this came out of a lot of the uh, the needs assessment. Any feedback? Oh, go ahead, Graham. Is that second one relevant still, we think, since I think schools are reopened or are reopening? That's a great question. I don't know. I mean, I think that we're going to, unless or until, you know, I think we've still, from what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing is we've got two to three years before COVID is like completely. And, you know, I think we're still going to run the risk of, kids being, you know, having to quarantine for two weeks, um, the impact on them as well as their classrooms and their families. Um, I also think employers, um, you know, many employers closed offices um, may have to move because of, you know, economic impacts and so forth. So I think we're gonna continue to see some level of impact from these um, for a while yet. And going into the next school year, we may see uh, impacts on educational outcomes for kids who are out of school for a year um, or not doing very much. So, Brian. I think the last one maybe could is more of a tier three okay. box than a tier two. And, and it's, it's really broad. And it's basically the reiteration of the safety net pillar tier one in some way. I don't know. Um, doesn't seem to be at the same level. Okay. A bunch of these focus on kids and like, you know, we've got like school achievement, um, schools being closed, um, readiness for kids. Um, that last one is really, in, Decreasing unhealthy and risky behaviors and educating and training the workforce are the only two that like address adults in some way. Um, and I'm kind of curious if there's some broad thing that we can bring in that would address some of the like that education and skill building or if like that ends up falling. I think that the very first one we had things around like how do you prepare for jobs and so forth. So maybe most of them fall in there rather than this education and skill building section. That makes sense. Wonder, Caitlin, when you look at the activity that's linked to decrease unhealthy and risky behaviors, I'm, I'm guessing that's also oriented at children. Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing there is I feel like some of the stuff around health also falls into that decreasing unhealthy and risky behaviors. So I think about like, we had the organization last year that wanted to provide, um, that was basically providing um, like resources and education around like sexual activity and teen pregnancy um, that would be, that's an activity, but that's also like, that's health, but it's also decreasing unhealthy and risky behaviors. So, um, 
<laughs> I think that falls into the Ellie Berto's comment that some of like this can be really hard on some of our um, some of our applicants because it's both. <laughs> Life is never neat. <laughs> But I do agree that 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 bottom one for sure should either probably be a tier three or should be somewhere else. I would suggest otherwise. I think they they are pretty straightforward. The it, having gone through this, you know, once before, it it just like there's always an output that leads to an out, one person's outcome is another person's output, you know, and it just keeps going down the, the line until we're all dead and that's the final outcome. And, you know, it's, so at some point it's like, it's just gonna be imperfect. Right. But they seem logical. Other comments or questions on the outcomes for this safety, this uh, education and skill building? Okay. I think we're ready to go to the next one, Eliberto. Safety and justice. Um, one outcome I don't see here that I think we talked about that I would propose adding um, is services or programs that are designed to uh, reduce recidivism and provide support to folks coming out of the criminal system in some way. Um, because we, there's really clear indications that recidivism is reduced when there are sufficient supports and reduction in recidivism has, you know, uh, basically helps provide <laughs> more safety to a community um, as a whole. So um, I would propose some, an outcome that is geared in that direction um, that would account for things like, you know, while courts are not meeting in person, making sure that people have access to phones so they can show up to their, um, hearings, you know, because if folks are not dangerous, but are can't attend their hearing like that just does not that ultimately doesn't make our community safer. Um, so Okay. Brian. Kimberly, I'm trying to make you feel better about the three times you spoke up, you don't feel bad. Um, so I wonder if the top one, again, thinking about outcomes in this term access, if the access actually is more of an output than an outcome, if it's more like increased utilization of advocacy and legal representation resources or something, you know, where like just opening the door may not be enough. You may have to actually pull people through the door or make sure they know it's open. Um, because what we really want them to do is be able to use these resources. So, um, I like that. I, I, yeah, no, I, I like that, Brian, because, I mean, Lee, so I want to tell you the ones I've had the hardest time with. This one and, and the health one, uh, because a lot of times it's about, it's about getting people to the service more than about um, what the service does for the people. Um, you know, for example, when I talk to several legal of the, our legal providers, like, you know, we don't, we don't know. It takes a long time to do a case. So it's hard to measure, you know, where was my, was my situation resolved? I think that's the best outcome for legal representation, right? Res re resolution of the legal situation. But, I, you know, maybe it's, yeah, maybe it is utilization and saying increased utilization of legal representation and it is a sort of a butts and seat type of thing but it focuses on 
the the resident side of the equation, right? So it's not just that they're open more hours; it's that more people are using them. I, I don't know. That's not, that's always a tricky one. Yeah, I mean that this one does feel like, it, in many ways, access is the barrier for things because you know non-criminal things people don't aren't entitled to a lawyer but we know like for immigration i think there's something like if you have a lawyer you're 10 times more likely to be successful in like appealing an immigration decision if not more um than if you don't have a lawyer so like like literally just accessing it is enough to make a difference um in the outcomes so do, do you want to leave it as access or do you want utilization or do you want to add utilization to it? So they, they have some choice? I think adding utilization would work here. Okay. Kimberly. I think that's great. And I think by extension, um, the second box, increase participation in programs that provide protection and support. Um, so I think that's a big barrier. Survivors of child abuse and domestic violence may not actually utilize those services or participate. So that would be the true measure, I think, of success um, by the same extension of access versus utilization. Ryan. Shakita raised her finger, uh, not her digital hand, but her Okay, finger. Shakita. Um, what I found a lot of times is, I know you're talking about utilizing legal rep, legal services, but a lot of times people can't afford legal services, right? Mm -hmm. I think that is, for me, that would be the key thing. Like, I know there are attorneys out there, but can I afford those attorneys, mm -hmm. you know? And then the, eternal, the attorneys that are providing pro bono services are always booked up. So you're talking years down the line before you can get a pro bono attorney. So what happens then? You know, yeah, I know everyone knows there's legal representation, but can you afford it? And that's what that's what increasing access is about. So, but maybe it's less about like access. Maybe access isn't the right word there. Maybe it's um, improved affordability. Um, increase in number of in clients served, uh, increase in number of cases that they're able to take um, or something like that. Like, so that is like access, but it's like access is not, maybe not the right word because everyone t technically has access. It's just whether, can they afford it? Does the person have time? And so maybe we just tweak that slightly to be increase affordability, um, number of people served, number of um, cases able to be serviced or something like that. And that may be in the program activity, if it said provide affordable legal support, that would presumably then support the outcome of increased utilization. So uh, maybe it falls more on that side. Okay. Anything else on the safety and justice pillar? Okay, on to the next one. I think this is the last one. questions or comments on these outcomes? Yes, Brian. I think you're going for the prize. Oh my God, I'm, I'm, I almost hate <laughs> to hear myself talk. Um, I'm gonna give you the Zoom crown. I'm gonna try to make this the last comment, but um, we know that's not going to happen. So the 
I think this is an excellent example of how interpreting the needs assessments can be really challenging because in the top box, we have a specific target audience, which is at-risk families, individuals, and youth. Uh, we know what we're looking for, housing stability, like that, that statement to me is a really good outcome. The bottom one is kind of vague. It doesn't, you know, it's just generalized. Uh, and the, yet I know they were both expressed in the needs assessment in some way. Um, so I wonder if, are, are they actually different? It, do we have a different audience or, or different customer base for the top than the bottom? We do. Okay. We do. Um, so typically the ones on the bottom are not housed. The ones on the top are housed and we're trying to stabilize them. Got it. Thank you. And for the bottom one, I, I, again, I wonder if this is just instead of increased access, it's maybe increased capacity for transitional housing or shelter and increased utilization. Because we, I mean, more transitional housing and shelter, like some of our partners provide transitional housing. And if they're able to provide more beds or more um, locations for that, that's better. And, you know, folks being able to utilize that. I, I like to utilize for this funding. I don't like, we don't, this funding doesn't fund building of more beds or I think this is more on the program side than the than the construction or the capacity side. On this, the capacity is that we're gonna increase case management in transitional housing, right? But I don't think we with this money, we fund. Well, but like, I think of like Hope, one of the things they funded was employees to be able to keep their shelter open additional days, which increased the capacity that they could do, okay. um, right? Like, cause they couldn't do it unless they had someone who was em employed who could right. work the desk. And, and, and so it wasn't necessary and it was very specifically shelter um, for them. Right, right. Yeah, I just don't want to, I just don't want to be confusing. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of Kathy's yeah. realm. This one might be interesting to see what the other collaborator collaborators say as well of like how, you know, what the outcome is there, you know. Yeah. Cause because I think to Ellie Berzo's point, you know, this particular pot of money is more for operational support. And we use our CDBG, our home, our affordable housing funds um, to really work on the the rehab, acquisition, and construction of of units. Mm, so what if um, for this one, in, it's, we're actually not even looking at increasing access to it so much as increasing support, like operational, because you mentioned like, we talked about like caseworkers and mm -hmm. folks that provide those. And so it's like maybe um, providing operational support to um, reduce transitional homelessness or, you know, or something like that, like reduction in number of um, people on the street <laughs> or something like that. Um, well, there's well, gotta be some outcome right there that like no, 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 that's good. supports is doing. I'm thinking that, 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 that clicks something in my brain. Um, so maybe the outcome is increased housing exits for clients in transitional housing and shelter or increased successful exits. I mean, not housing, just successful exits. Because that's really, when I think about the agencies we fund, that's what they use this money for is to help people move out of the temporary situations. Right, right. That's right. what they use the money for typically. Right. That yeah, I think 
I think Alberto, you're you're on it. We can figure out the the language, but yeah, it's really about it's it's a different level of stabilization. It's moving from either unhoused or temporarily housed into more permanent stable housing. So I, th- I think we probably, if, if I'm understanding that, which I think makes, makes sense. Um, and, and I think we have samples of language from that with our homeless solutions. And so but I think those are good distinctions. So I've noted it. Okay, awesome. Great. Anything else yeah. on this pillar? Uh, Karen Phillips. You know, I, I feel like I'm a little bit of a simpleton here, but the reason that we are doing this, the purpose of this is for organizations to pick a uh, outcome to get their money. Is that the purpose of all this? That's exactly right. It's really about, so I think, so it's, I think it's, it's two, twofold, Karen. I think it's one, we want to share our values or our, what we feel are the goals or outcomes that we think are important for our community with our agencies. And then two, it's, it's them sharing with us how their work aligns with what we feel with the board and, or the collaborative feels is important for our community. At least that's the way I look at it. Okay, okay, thank you. And, and it's not just what we feel, it's, it's also linked to the assessment. Right, right. 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 What, 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 we, what we learn from the What the community is, yeah, experiencing. So they pick one of these and then go for it. And do the right. whole, okay, got it. Yep. Yeah. And I can show you where they pick it in the next, the next part. There you go. It's coming up. Okay. Moving along then, Eliberto. It is still your show. So take Let us away. I, I'm going to stop sharing here. Um, and I'm going to go to the next one. Um, bring it up. Okay, and I'm going to share it. So the next piece, again, because we're in the midst of getting ready, is looking at the actual application. So this is the 2021 application. Um, the first piece is about the agency. So we asked for a description about the agency, their purpose, function of the organization, unique services, um, and their strategic goals. Um, we asked them to upload a board of directors table. Uh, we asked them to, when we talk about inclusive board and staff practices, we asked them to describe what their plan to create, increase and maintain diversity and inclusive pra- practices are. Um, and then we give them a, a, a table to fill out to, to demonstrate that diversity. Um, Eliberto, just a quick question. I know we're going through this. Is um, would you like folks to give feedback or suggestions as we go through this, or ask questions? What's how? What's the best way to proceed here, and what's the goal that we're, with looking at this? So I think if there are if there are suggestions, I think those are fine. So we are going to be. You know, to Karen's point, there's further conversations. I don't know how this application is going to end up. I did have a meeting last week about it, and Boulder had some things they wanted to to change already. So for me, this is just giving me um, helpful input that I can bring back to the yeah. next meeting. Um, yeah, I think it. I think it's really about if there is, and I. You know, Alberto, I think we probably wanted to review a section and then stop and get feedback. So if there are if there are tweaks in the language or if there is, you know, some question that you think we should add or something we should take away, if you can just provide that input to Alberto and then when and then he will take it again to the 
to the uh, funders and and they'll they'll really kind of um, review that and negotiate what 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 changes are made and what needs to stay the same. So any, any, any thoughts on the agency narrative piece? Um, one thing I was gonna suggest is this inclusive board and staff practices. It asks for your organization's plan. It does not ask you to report on how your organization has already implemented anything um, and what has been like whether you've tried something, because I think we probably have seen many organizations that come in and are like, oh yeah, we've been talking about this, but you literally see no results. Um, like I'd love to understand what their history is of like trying to do this um, and have they been successful at it. Okay. We can do that. Other feedback or thoughts on this section, the the narrative and other information here for the agency? Seeing none, I think you can move along, Aliberto. <laughs> so, so these are just tables. Um, I'm not gonna, more tables um, around projected clients. Um, we do ask them about, uh, to, to, and we don't really get tons of stuff here about any type of narrative. Hey, buddy. So, but we typically don't get a lot of data here, to be honest. Okay. Then it's the budget. These are the things, these are the the, we first start with revenue, where the revenue comes. They, there's a lot of these you can drop down, you can add, you know, you can add things under these. Um, so for example, under other foundations, you can add as many foundations as you have or you want. Um, and just to clarify, this is the agency budget, the overall right. agency, and then the program for which you're applying, that budget comes later. Right, that comes in the program piece. Eliberto, sorry, could, could you go back a page with that demographics right now it's just a narrative would it be possible to provide sort of like a blank table where they could provide like what demographics they track um so that we can see it more easily i know some of them don't but like if someone does um I, we could definitely ask the we could definitely ask the, the group if we could because it, it was hard to compare that um to, and to see that when they give a narrative of it and they don't actually like put in, you know, hi, we serve, you know, only women or we serve the LGBTQ population and here's the breakdown of, by race or things like that. Like it would help us at least see like what, you know, what demographics are you tracking and why is that important? And like, what's the breakdown of the, the clients you serve based on the demographics you track? I Yeah, we can ask for sure. Uh, Brian. Thank you. On the uh, the budget, one thing that I've I've kind of always been confused by is the amount of degree that agencies should add. Like some agencies under salaries, for instance, will list individual positions for their agency budget, and then the salary, and others will just say salaries and have one number. Is there an intention of what the, the collaborative's looking for there? So I would say, Ryan and, and Karen can may have other thoughts. For me, at the agency level, I don't see why an agency would break it down by individual salaries. I think for me at this level, it's all, it's just the overall um, personnel cost. Okay. There is a reason to do it at the program level if you're asking for funding mm. for a specific position within the project. So okay. I, I think people do it by do it by habit, but I'm not necessarily interested in at the agency level the breakdown. I don't care if you have thoughts on that. 
So I, what I don't remember, Aliberto, is, is what is in the instructions. Um, it's, it's, so it, we've, we've gone this particular um, advisory board, not, not you all here, but in the, in his, historically, we have asked for, and the agency budget, we've asked for um, salary breakdowns of, ver of very specific positions and um and and then sometimes we haven't so i i i think to Alberto's point i think um the value in really understanding the um the salary breakdown is at the program level um you know rather than the the agency level a agencies pretty much push back about um putting that um that information in the in the application, and I and I would say in in, in the past, some of our advisory board members have um, have um, made judgments about positions that either are making their price too high, or they're maybe not making enough money, and you, you know, and I don't know whether I don't think that's really the purview of this advisory board, so. Um, so, I mean, that's that. That's really that's helpful. what I know historically. <laughs> so I wonder if it could say like cumulative or something like that, where we're really kind of giving some direction on you know what level of detail. I can look at the instructions, and I can Boulder sometimes asks for more than we do. So I can also I can bring that up with the with the collaborative too, Brian. Great. Hi, Diana. Welcome. We're currently going through the application and giving feedback or asking questions about sort of a section at a time um, to so that Eliberto can take feedback back to the um, funding collaborative since this is a shared application between um, Bold City of Boulder, County of Boulder, and Longmont. Okay, thank you. Sorry I'm late, everyone. Hope practice was good. Okay, go ahead, Eliberto. So then the next piece also within the budget, there's always an access, uh, you know, um, you know, if, if you have a negative, you need to explain it. Um, or if you have an access, you should explain it as well. Uh, most agencies try to have an access. There's very few that try to zero out. There's some that zero out, but most try to have at least a little bit so that they can add to their operating reserves. Um, but that's what that that piece is, and it's, it's a narrative question. Um, and there's also an important piece here, and that's the agency's reserve, the agency reserves, because that's part of what me and Karen, our, our evaluation, we do evaluate reserves. Um, and typically, a uh, best practice is between three and six months of reserves, uh, of the operating reserves. Um, so I know I've, I've, I've deducted points if an agency, you know, just doesn't have reserves for, you know, to if something were to happen that they couldn't continue. So that is an important one to us. Oh. It seems like that policy may bear some reconsideration for a couple of years following COVID. I imagine and that's a good point. That's a good point. Drain their reserves. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure many agencies did. So we may have to be a little more lenient on reserves because it may take a while to come back. Well, and I think it, it also is it provides the opportunity because they usually um, explain it. So it, it could be that what we learn is that agencies that have that have utilized a reserve you know were were able maybe to come through and um the the pandemic in a in a better place than if they would not have had any reserve so I, there's there's a story to tell for sure right. so then we now we come to we come to where you all do most of your work 
And that's, that's the program section. Um, so let me show you the first thing that we need to see is the goal area of focus. So the work that we just did, this is where it's reflected. And it's a, it's a drop down. Once the goal areas or the, the, the outcomes are decided upon, they will be they will be a drop down right here um, that agencies choose. Um, and then we come into, I mean, this is really the bulk of the application, um, which we ask about. So to, to some of the, the conversation we were having earlier, this is why we asked that community change, right? Question, knowing that it's hard to, knowing that it's hard to track and measure community change, but we wanna know what community change are they interested in addressing? Knowing full well that they may not be able to track right, all, all how their program impacts, for example, obesity rates, right? There's multiple variables to that. Uh, and their program may not be the only thing that changes that, but we wanna know what that that's what they're trying to address. Does that make sense? Yep. Anyone have questions about that? And so as we go down, yeah, go ahead, Karen. So actually I had um, at, the, at the beginning when we're talking about the goal area of, of focus, I'm, I'm thinking we, we need to rewrite that intro just a little bit because it says um, what, what goal area fits the proposed program. So it almost like the program is, it, it, I think it should be flipped. I think we really want to talk about um, you know, the goal area, what goal area are you, um, you know, accomplishing? Cause it almost sounds like the, the tail is wagging dog. This is the program that I want to offer. And then here's where it fits. I know it's a detail, but I think it's really about, this is the outcome we're trying to accomplish and, you know, and, and, and how you are proposing to, um, address it. So I just think it's, it's tweaking that intro just a little bit. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Kimberly, go ahead. Um, I had a question on that same area. It says if the program spans more than one goal, applicants will need to complete another program application and logic mod model. So I know that was referenced earlier. I'm just thinking back to the risky behaviors of youth and how that can be under education, but it might be more appropriate under health. So would an applicant have to do two applications for both of those areas yep you only okay. get one one area per per application and they they could apply for the exact same program and the same amount in two different goal areas and we could choose to fund it under one and not the other correct you know that's a great question i don't know if we've seen people do that but that would be like maybe it's like it would... possible they can apply know. for more than one program but I think what we're trying to indicate is that they have to, even though there might be multiple um, areas that they try to address or outcomes, it's it's still it's still really one one program and one outcome. They can apply for more than one program, but they have to make a choice about what's the primary outcome they're trying to accomplish. Right, but this sentence doesn't say that. So, so we might need to have it more clear. Right, because I, I read this and say, if the program spans more than one goal, applicants need to complete another program application and logic model for that goal. And I don't think that's what we are. Well, so that's a great question that we need to some clarification, but I, because I that's not how we are doing that in practice. Right. Yeah. Great question. This also strikes me as like, we're asking applicants to determine which of the outcome, like which of our outcomes it is um, and trying to like pigeonhole it. Like, you know, they might apply under health and education because that's where they think it falls. But like, when you look at it, it really does fall under housing stability or something like that. Um, 
And so if they pick wrong, they might not get funded because they picked the wrong category that it went in because we put all of, you know, 50, you know, 35% of our funds toward housing stability. Um, so that's one thing where like, we're asking them to do it, but then we, we've actually... moved them. I was going to say, we've, we've moved we... them for that yeah. very reason. It says yeah. like, well, you know, so it, it's, it's, it has been a conversation um, sometimes among the legal providers. So like legal aid um, or Boulder County Legal Services has said, you know, I shouldn't be pigeon pigeonholed in legal services. What I'm really doing is I'm helping, you know, we're helping with housing stability or blah, blah, blah. So, um, so we've moved um, entities. Okay. Got it. All right. Um, for that phrasing, one thing we might consider is like, which of the following, um, program outcomes best fits what you're trying to accomplish or something like that, um, with this program, um, or which of the following like community needs right. it, does your program address? Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely look at that. Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily want to go through each of these questions. I just, if, you, if you get a chance to look at them. I think just so if, if people have, if, yeah. if members have any suggestions, that would be great. Any questions or suggestions around these, these questions? Okay, I think you're good to move on, Eliberto. Okay. So oh, we go back to demographics. Here's where we ask them. How many unduplicated clients are serving in Longmont? Their age, race, ethnicity. Um, I guess this is more, that part's more important really than what the agency, the overall agency serves since we're funding the program and not the agency. Right, right. Gender. Um, that one is both on the board demographics and here that one's weird to me because ma male female transgender like there are duplicate there's duplication in there because someone may be male or female and transgender um and so like the totals that one just is weird to me. And I think that it should probably be like, I don't know if the funding collaborative, like if anyone else has brought that up, but. Um, yeah. Do we take this from census, Karen? I forget. I don't know, I, but I'm imagining, I think it's a good question to bring up with the, the partners. Um, yeah. Certainly there's been a lot of, um, a, a lot of different, you know, language and how people want to be referred to. So I, I think that is, that's one that we'll have to be, we'll have to look at and see what, yeah. and, and I don't know what do we comes, ask there? Right. I don't know if it comes from like uh, federal guidelines, federal census or HUD or, you know, one of those. Yeah. Yeah. We, we can definitely look into that one. And then again, to your point earlier, Kaylin, if you want, we could try and add a table here to see if they, if there's, if there's other, other yeah. demographics that they, you know, blank table. I don't know if that's possible in the system. The system is limited to a certain extent, but we could definitely ask. Yeah. Or is, I don't know if that's something they could like attach something if they have other demographics and encourage yeah, them to true. do that. It's like, you know, if there are other demographics you, you track for your, you know, who's being served, you know, please attach that so yeah. that we can see it. Um, okay. That might be easier. I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up. Okay. So then the next piece is really the funding request budget. Um, and this is where we're asking them to provide program revenue. Uh, and this is always, I always, always have issues with a few agencies here. And I'll, and I'll show you where the, where the issues are. Um, so 
it doesn't well, that's weird it didn't copy it right so you're, you're seeing it so this this basically looks like this basically look looks like the agency one you're not seeing it but it just it has all these different it for some reason it didn't copy it right i just noticed it right now uh but um it, it, it has it's a table and they can put all different sources of how that agency is funding. Um, and then this table is where it gets tricky, the, the expense one, because we're, what we're asking them to do is say, you know, up here, we ask them what their request is on that first column, right? So we want 15,000 from Longmont, right? What, let's say this is 15,000. And here's all the revenue. This one has all the revenue from the program in, you know, everything from foundations, donors, et cetera. And then we, we, what we want them to do is say, okay, so we, we want you to list all your expenses. We know that we can't cover all of your expenses. So we want to know how you're going to use our money. And then we want to know how you cover the rest of the money, rest of the expenses. That's what the other funding sources are uh, column is for. And there's always confusion there. Um, so that usually affects the excess or shortfall. Um, but that's basically how that works is we want to know what all the revenues come from for that program. And we want to know how you're going to, what your, what your expenses are. But in particular, if this is, this is only for those that apply to Longmont. If you would apply to Boulder, you would have columns for city of Boulder and um, Boulder County, right? This is only for us at this point. But that's how that works. And then they have an excess or a shortfall for the program. Any questions, uh, Brian? Berto, I'm, I'm looking at the language. I'm going to pull up my copy here. So under funding award expenditure, the, the first paragraph makes sense. And then it says, second paragraph says, please demonstrate how requested funds from each funder, from each funder will be expended for the program during the grant year. Your program budget for each funder should total the amount you requested in the funding request section of this application. Uh, and I'm wondering if that's a little confusing because the funding request in my eyes is just what I'm requesting from the city of Longmont. So Brian, this, this application is not typical because remember, we're the only ones that did an application in 2021. So typically you would have up here you would have city of Longmont request, city of Boulder request, Boulder County request in that bottom column, that bottom row. Okay. And then other, I assume there's an other, like if you're getting. Not, no, there, no, it's only because you're only applying to us. The but you're column, asking for expenditures for the entire program. Right. And that's where the other funding sources come, that far right column. Right. And then. Typically, you would have two more columns, one for Boulder County and one for City of Boulder. Mm -hmm. For my, If I understand what you're asking, Brian, if you go back a page where it has like, it right. has 2021 program revenue. So it's, it'd be like the line item on the left. So it'd be like United Way, $15,000 would go in that 2021 program revenue column. Right. So there's going to be no funding request from anybody for that. But then right. you may have like City of Longmont, and it will show up in the city of Longmont funding request there. Um, right. So generally any line item would only appear in, you know, you'd have the, you know, city of Longmont, you might have $15,000 as your total program revenue. And that's what you're requesting from Longmont to make exactly. that. Revenue. Exactly, exactly right. Hmm. It's just that this, this application doesn't have the others because we're the only ones who had an application. So we removed the other two columns. Does that make sense, Brian? Yeah, I, th I think so, yep. And I think, and then of course there's a, 
budget narrative. Um, and that's it. All right. Any other feedback or questions from folks on that application? All right, Eliberto and Karen, do you have what you need for for that? All right. Um, then I think we're moving on to the next item on our agenda, which is city investment in human services and other approaches for determining an amount the amount of the investment. So this is me or this is you, Karen? Uh, you're just continuing on. I'll open it up. So. Um, and and I don't know whether I don't know whether you we need to pull this up as a as a um, something right. to look at, but I believe um, at the last uh, advisory board meeting we talked about uh, staff talked about that we would be requesting in the twenty twenty two budget a um, the to increase the set aside of funding for human service agencies to three percent. That the current what was um, what was allocated in the budget for 2021 was 2.52 percent. We have been you know we've been on a path um, to to basically increase the set aside amount to three percent um, over a three year period. We we didn't get as much as we had hoped for in the 2021 budget because of the state of of revenues, if you will. So um, we did go ahead and we, we've made a request. The, our budget process hasn't closed yet. It closes the end of May. But we did put in a, a request for, uh, for taking that all the way up to 3%. At this point in time, I can't tell you what that means in terms of an increased amount of revenue because we have not, our, our budget office has not yet projected what that amount of revenue will be. For, for the city of Longmont in 2022. Um, our, our, our revenues for the first three months, I haven't looked at March, March just came in, but our revenues uh, for the general fund revenues for the city of Longmont have been pretty darn strong the first three months of this year. So for what's that that's worth that that's a better that's better than um oh my gosh we're we're looking at a reduction so so i think the question that came up from the advisory board is so wh what does three percent mean you know is three percent um what other entities use i mean how, how what do we compare it to in terms of other um other entities that fund human services you know, is there is there a benchmark? And I think the other thing that and so that and the question was, well, should we be instead of saying three percent of the general fund budget, uh, general fund revenues for the city, should we be looking at some other metric to decide what what should be what we should be setting aside for human service agency grants? So I think it was like, should it be a per capita? What what? What else should we be looking at as a metric for an appropriate amount of money to be requesting from the city council to support human service agencies through this grant program? And so um, Eliberto took us a, a stab at, at that um, and also reached out to city of Boulder and, and Boulder County really to find out about, you know, what, what do they use in terms of determining the amount that they put in their human service agency grants every year. There also was a, um, just a, a question about an acknowledgement that the city of uh, Longmont also funds a variety of programs directly and a variety of services directly. So there is a broader base of support that our city council funds beyond the human service agency um, grants. And so, so that is what um, Eliberto put in your packet. Just 
And that really would just be for some, you know, uh, discussion. It's our, it's the, it's the beginning of that conversation. About a week ago, we said, okay, it's time to look at the agenda and put that together. And we're reviewing the, the notes from the uh, meeting in April. And we're like, oh, <laughs> we said we would bring this back. So, uh, so bad on us. We've made it a point now to uh, the week after we uh, have the meeting, we're going to look at what we made a commitment to so that we weren't that we aren't surprised by something we said we would do and we didn't allow enough time to do that. So, so we can continue to, uh, uh, you know, flesh this out. What, um, what we have in your packet when it talks about other human services provided by the city, what we can do is we can put some dollars to that. We did not put dollars to that. We have a priority based budgeting program in the city and each one of these particular programs um, we can pull out um, the amount of money that goes toward that and we just um, we we didn't do that so we we will put the dollar amount to um to that uh four four pages of, of programs that the the city funds directly so that you can have a better picture of of that investment. So I apologize that that we um, we we gave you a partial presentation. So so anyhow, what would be great is um, any conversation that you have about you know is is this helpful? Are we on the right track? Is there some other information that you would like to see? Um, so I'll I'll just I'll just kind of you know. Leave it at that and invite your 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 comments about what else would be helpful. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, Graham. So are these programs funded by the city because they're staffed by the city or commissioned by the city or there's city oversight in more detail than like the grant process? What like why do they get money without this process and other nonprofits? It's a direct. It's it. It would be. It's a. It's a direct um, service that the city is providing. So it just would be like the police department budget, or the parks budget, or the firefighters budget. So those are services directly provided by the city. And they are, um, and they are directly funded by the city. And and their their funding, whether they get funded, how much they get funded, is that is that all filtered through the same sort of uh, community feedback loop, loop and prioritization that that we do here when we take we figure out well what matters to the community and then fund fund things. Over there. It's, it's, um, yes, I mean that process looks different. Mm -hmm. You know, then we um, then we do that in the um, then how we do that for our grant funding. So I mentioned and what we can and what we'll do, um, Graham, is send you a, a link. Um, so we and, and actually many municipalities throughout Colorado and I think out the, the, um, the country are using what we call priority based budgeting. So. Um, so that is how we come up with um, the prioritization, you know, if if you will, of of the services and how much you know different um, services do receive. So there is there is a, we have a a, a waiting system um, for for the service that helps put that puts the service in either um, a, a priority one, two, three, or four um, tier. We, um, we do every so often, and I don't, it, it probably, I'm just gonna spitball it here. It's about maybe every five years um, that we go out and we do get input from the community about, um, about the community's priorities. Um, so that is all written up in, um, and you can find that on the city's website. So I, we will send you a link 
There's a lot of, and you can just at your leisure go through that um, and and see all the the processes that go um, that goes into that. So so like in in theory, if you um, if you are um, you know a, a, a level one program, which usually means it means a lot of things. It means like you you have no choice but to provide that service. It's a mandate to provide that service. Um, there's there's various criteria um, that then these each of these programs gets scored based on that criteria and your overall score um, helps to determine in what tier that you um, that you 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 fall so to speak and then what that should mean is that a city government should be investing. A, um, a higher proportion of its funds in those services that are, say, level one, that are that meet that higher criteria or priority, and and they sh- and the city should be investing fewer dollars in those programs that are at level four, for example. Not that you would never ever fund ever not fund level four services, but but it should, if we say these are the highest priorities, then those are the things that probably should get most of, of, of the money. So, you know, example, public safety, right? Maybe not the good example to you, but, you know, it is, that is the, that is the role of, of city government. And, um, and so that gets a higher rating than, say, Many of the programs that we provide in community services where, um, you, you know, so it it might be great that we have, a, you know, a Lamont Youth Center that provides a, a lot of services that help um, youth development services. But um, but it probably doesn't. That really is kind of more of a a, a, a choice that the city makes versus it's a mandate that we provide for the safety of our community through fire and police services. Not that the other isn't, you know, so, so, so clearly children, youth and families is, isn't, you know, they're, they don't have a special tax, two special taxes. Well, actually they do have part of a special tax actually, but they're, they're not going to be, they're not going to have a $50 million budget as compared to say, um, you know, fire and police. Alberto, you're smiling. How am I? <laughs> I think you does protest too much. <laughs> uh, Kimberly, did you have a question or comment? Did that help, Graham? That's a long answer to your question. <laughs> but there is a whole big process that we will send to you and it will make more sense. Thank you. Sorry. I just wanted to thank you for putting this together. I really appreciated seeing the trends over time. And it was especially interesting to see the numbers broken down um, based off of the poverty level too, which was really helpful to see how that changes the numbers. So thank you for all the time you put into it. Yes, agreed. Um, One thing I thought was interesting was I just did like a quick search for what City of Boulder's 2020 general fund budget was to see how that like $2.7 million that they set aside compared to their overall funding. And they were at like 1.6% of the general fund, assuming that like my numbers matched up um, for the right years. Um, So the fact that like, yes, they put more into it and but they also apparently had significantly higher like total general fund revenue um what i found interesting is when i reached out to my colleagues um none of them knew how that number was put in place uh they just know it's a number that they've been working with for years but nobody knew how that number came about i thought that was interesting um so yeah, I they said this is a number, and, and on occasion we'll ask for an increase. Uh, Boulder County, in particular, asked for a cost of living increase, 
Um, but yeah, nobody knew exactly how it originated. It's just the number that they've been working with. Interesting. Uh, Brian. I, I really appreciate you putting this together. And um, I, I love data. I, I think there's always something to learn in it. So seeing the trend year over year and kind of, you know, some of the aberrations that happen uh, and being able to compare it to other municipalities, I think is really valuable because it's good to know, like when we're being perhaps a little unreasonable in what we're asking or, you know, taking for granted what we have or knowing that perhaps we really do need more. Um, so I find it very helpful. Thank you. I want to echo that, like comparing it to the poverty rate and then seeing sort of like the trailing, because obviously what's set aside for a year is like decided a, the year before. And then you don't necessarily know the poverty rate until, you know, a year or two later because of like data collection and so forth. So it's interesting to see that like 2017, the per capita based on the poverty rate was really low. But then the following year, it looks like, you know, there was more put aside and there was there was some effective work there like it's almost like you see that the the poverty rate dropped significantly between 2017 and 2018 so even though that was a low per capita number in 2017 there was a lot that you know whether that's because it wasn't all coming from the human services funding um or something else like you just at the very least you can kind of see that there's there's an impact there. Um, so. So it's, it's, it's data. I don't know if it um, compels any of you or the group to think about our, our, our metric or our set aside for human service agency grants any, any differently so, so absent that, we'll ask for three percent, and then we'll continue to, you know, you know, to to massage this. I mean, I think it was a great question. I mean, it was like, so what's what's so magical about three percent? So it was it was a great question, and I think something that is um, worthy of our considering to to look at that. And Karen, I, I would add that, you know, it's great to be able to compare to communities and also recognize that I, like Palm Beach, I don't know what their per, per capita um, number is because there's probably not as much need. I'm, I'm, and, uh, you know, I have no clue. I mean, people say the same thing about Boulder. So, um, but I think it can be helpful to have this kind of year over year because we largely know that it's not enough. I mean, there's still not enough affordable housing. There's still too many people who don't eat regularly, all of that, but we can see there's progress being made. And, you know, then it, it becomes something that we can actually work with rather than just hyperbole or an emotional reaction to a situation. Okay, great. So I, I I think, Caitlin, that's it for this one, unless um, we hear anything else. And then I think Ellie Berto has one more <laughs> show for today. Okay. I don't see, I don't see any other comments. Again, thank you for, for helping put that together and give us a context of what, you know, the funding that we're doing, what context that operates in. Um, I don't think, it doesn't sound like anyone has a like, you know, burning need to change that funding request, but just being able to see that and understand the context we're in, I think is really, really helpful. Um, so, Eliberto, back to you. You're on mute. All right, so last thing, um, just because the board asked for an update on the American Rescue Plan, uh, we, Karen and I presented this to the St. Vrain Community uh, Council um, a few weeks ago. 
And the truth is we're, st we're still working on it. I mean, the caveat is there's a lot of conversations going on about how this fund is utilized. I will say I did learn this week, um, there's quite a bit of money coming in for rental assistance to the county. I think I heard uh, around $17 million. Um, so there, that, that's good to know. So there's quite a bit of, of funding for rental assistance. Um, but I'm gonna go through this quickly. This is, this is based off on something that was done for city council previously. Um, and I just, I, we just took the highlights of it uh, and there's more, more to come. Uh, we are still working on, on figuring all of this out. So um, this is, this, this 15.3 million is the, the this, what we call the CVRF or the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Um, wait, no, no, sorry. This is, this is the estimate that we're gonna get 15.3 million. Um, Actually, that has come down. Oh, see, I good, didn't know that. <laughs> it's it's probably about $2 million less than that is okay. the new revised estimate. So things are changing as we speak. Um, and I think having worked on the CVRF fund, I'm so happy it's more flexible. Uh, it, it was very difficult to work with that funding. Uh, it was very complicated and... Um, we did help a lot of people with it, uh, but it was it was challenging. Um, and so we're gonna get 50% right away and then we're gonna get more later. Um, so that's good. What can it be used for? Well, it can be used to respond to the public health emergency. And that means a lot of different things, uh, but here's something it can, it, can, it can help households. And we're looking at that in particular around utility, we, we, we've, we've learned that there's a lot of utility assistance needs. And I am really advocating to see how we, we, we did have a program with the COVID relief fund to help with utility needs. So we wanna bring that up. That's been an issue. Uh, we can help small businesses. We did that with the, with the first round as well with the CBRF fund. And we did help uh, MPOs, uh, nonprofits. Uh, we did help, we, didn't, we helped a lot of childcare providers too when it comes to specific industries. I'm not sure we did much for tourism, travel, and hospitality. We'll see if we do it with this with this round of funding. Um, and so we can provide grants to employers. We can make investments in water, sewer, or broadband, speaking of the digital divide. And in fact, I think I saw something in the paper um, about new funding that allows for more help uh, for ne with Nextlight. It was, it was in the paper this, re this week. Um, and we can also fund our own services as well. So in particular, uh, I'm sure there's conversations around recreation and the fact that they lost a lot of revenue due, due to, to the, the lockdown and people couldn't access those services. What's different is that we're, last time it went through the county and then to us, this time we're getting it directly. Um, and this time, instead of doing reimbursement, the issue with reimbursement is you got to get ready for audits. And that has been, I've been working on childcare stuff since, since we got done with done giving out the CVRF fund because we want to be ready for an audit. And that's been a lot of work uh, getting ready for those audits. And it's not over just yet. Um, and that we we're still trying to figure out what revenue replacement is. Um, so we're still going to be dealing with audits, but it's going to be different. It's going to be more real time than what we, the way that we did it this time with the, the CVRF funds. Oh, sorry. Um, and then there is a project fund that we can work on capital projects. So we're still figuring out what this means at this point uh, for capital projects. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, it's gonna go to each state. Um, and of course the state will have a lot to do with it. Um, but I'm not sure if you know anything more about this, Karen, but I do not. Yeah. Um, so that's basically all. Um, here's some just broad categories. Housing retention efforts, like I said, 17 million in, in, in the pipeline for that. Uh, providers, family, children. So we, we, we may be helping ch child care providers some more. Uh, business assistance. Um, so like our boost grant that we, we gave $1.2 million to local uh, businesses, including some nonprofits. 
um, expanding of, of healthcare, and particularly around around um, um, vaccine uh, work and some infrastructure. And then here's some specific examples. Um, so we can do direct funding for local governments, grants for childcare providers, grants for nonprofits, uh, funding for mental health. Um, so there's a lot of money coming and we're still trying to figure out exactly how we're gonna use it. Um, Karen and I are gonna be in a meeting on Wednesday morning to get some, some more information about this. And I've invited our, our recovery manager to that meeting as well. So that's it. That's what we know at this point. Thanks, Eliberto. Seems like I <laughs> uh, appreciate all that staff is doing to wade through the, you know, the eligibility, the amounts, what we're allowed to use it for, where it's going to go. Um, it seems like, you know, that's a full-time job in and of itself just to figure that out. Um, not to mention actually like administering the funds. So really appreciate you being able to pull that together and, and sharing it with us. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments about that? It's pretty exciting. This is a uh, a very unusual opportunity, it seems, to get this level of federal funding with that kind of flexibility. I was thinking I, that the rent stabilization or like the rental assistance and so forth, that that amount um, has the potential to be, you know, to really stabilize things for many people in our community um, at a time when things have been very expensive and there's a lot of instability both for tenants as well as like landlords um like just hearing that amount i'm like oh that's a, that actually might make a huge difference when you know eviction moratoriums are are not there um that we may not see the like the rush to foreclosures and evictions and so forth that that could really destabilize the community for for years really you know, and I think the other thing that um, that I will, you know, quickly mention is 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 that because we have done a lot of work collectively and um, collaboratively within the county, there are continued conversations about how we can leverage these dollars that each community is getting to really make a big difference in specific areas. Because these are obviously these are one-time funds. And um, and and we 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 talk about it in, in terms of the the last disaster that we had, which was the the flood, and um, and what we were able to do with all of that investment to help us in recovery was the 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 millions of dollars that went into housing acquisition and building um, more affordable housing units. So out of that disaster, we were able to add. Um, over a thousand affordable housing units throughout Boulder County. So, so we're kind of looking at those big investments too. So certainly helping people recover. But if we are also looking at by 2035, Boulder County will have 12% of its housing stock be permanently affordable. Think about what this, what these dollars that are coming to all of the communities can do to help us really move forward in a huge way, uh, you know, some of those um, significant goals as it relates to housing. So we're trying to look at all of those kinds of things and determining how to, you know, really how to use, use these dollars. We don't want another pandemic for a while. We don't want to, we, it's good to have all of this investment, um, but we certainly don't want to have, um, we don't want to have, that level of investment, if you know what I mean, <laughs> for for more disasters. Um, so I think Karen had her hand up. Yep, Karen. I was just wondering, how are people going to know about these things? How are people going to know they're going to be able to get money for rent and things like that? So I think, so there, I know the, the, so a lot of the funding for rental is going to the housing helpline and I know they've been doing and, and, and are planning more right. 
social media type of stuff. They, um, uh, so that, that'll be happening throughout, um, getting stuff out there. Of course, word of mouth is huge, um, but yeah, there is definitely some plans to get the word out there. Yeah, I think it's a great it's a great point. So um, so there's has to be lots of different ways of communicating that. And, you know, it's it's not unlike what we're seeing with, the you know, with the vaccines and really looking at um, equitable access. So there isn't one size fits all that will um, help make sure that we're connecting with all members of our community that could benefit from the resources that are available. So that is um, absolutely something that right now we're trying to figure out what the heck we can do with it. And um, but also, you know, we need to have our mind on how to make sure um, folks really know about this incredible resource. It's a great point. I really uh, I I really want to thank you for also like highlighting the that housing helpline. Um, I've seen I've seen questions um, multiple times on like social media over the last month, um, where I've shared the link to, you know, where people can call for that, and a number of people have been like, I had no idea this existed. Um, so, um, and it sounds like from what I've heard, it has been really useful for folks to get connected to the right place. Um, so. Hopefully, hopefully some more awareness of that will, uh, you know, continued increasing awareness for that. All right, any other comments or questions on this? And do we have any other business? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion. Oh yes, Karen. I don't really have any other, well, I kind of do. It, I, it's really the question that we talked about initially. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll put that on our June meeting is when we see what Level Clear is all about, um, we might want to have a discussion in June if we want to... Um, if we want to continue to meet virtually, if we want to start meeting in person or what the heck we want to start doing. So, um, so anyhow, that will be on our radar and, you know, we'll, we'll bring back that conversation in, um, in June, if that's okay. If okay. you want to do another virtual meeting in, in June and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, do we ever want to get together again? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So that's all. Great. All right. If there is no other business, I will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion to adjourn. Seconded by anyone? Shakita seconds. We are adjourned. See you all in about a month. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Have a great month. Talk to you soon. Bye.